There's a kind of love that God only knows. I appreciate your work. Good morning, Cedar Rapids Christian Church. We are glad that you are joining us, whether in person or online. Uh, first things first, today, Nick is not preaching. You're welcome. I'm kidding. Uh, wow! <laughs> Uh, today, Whoa. actually, I'll be preaching. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through uh, 34, um, just to the end of, of chapter 6. It's going to be on relying on God and and kind of de-stressing. Mm. That's a, a message that we constantly need to be reminded of. More than just, you know, however often we've done these sermons, we need to remember, hey, we put our trust in God, and that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I will be taking you through that passage, and uh, I, yeah. Uh, moving right along in search of good friends and good times. Good times and good friends. I messed up the line. Um, online bulletin and bulletin. If you did not pick up your bulletin while you were uh, downstairs, go ahead and go downstairs. There's the bulletin. Um, and on our online, we will have the online bulletin as well. There are little things to fill out and go along with the sermon. Help you, help you focus and keep track. Yep, and uh, if you are here in person... Um, Go downstairs, grab your communion little cups, um, and be ready for when uh, uh, we will be led uh, before led to the Lord's table. Um, if you are at home, uh, grab a cracker, grab a graham cracker, grab whatever it is uh, uh, that you will use to participate in the Lord's Supper during our, our service. Um, we also uh, offer three different ways that you can give. Um, you can give by, sna by sna snail mail, by just sending uh, it in a little envelope with the stamp. Mike and I will get it. Uh, if you are here in person, you can always just drop, drop it off in the back of the room in the gold plates. Or you can always go online. Uh, there is a link on our website that you can click on, and it's very easy, and it will walk you through uh, uh, how to, how to do, do all that. But that's just a, a, another way that we worship uh, God is with our giving. Um, and then uh, also want to remind you that uh, we are looking for ways that we can encourage you. We are looking for ways that we can be praying for you. So please, please, please go to our website and, and fill out a, a prayer card. If you, it, it, if you just have a need uh, that's going on in your life, uh, we want to know about it. We want to be pr praying for it. So go to our website, fill out the, the prayer prayer card, and you can either keep it private between Mike, myself, and the elders, or we can put it on our our, our prayer chain, chain, but we just want to be encouraging to you. Okay, Wednesday nights are back in full force. Uh, last week we posted, you know, all the things that you need to know. If like, hey, if we cancel, we're not going to cancel unless it was negative twenty five. Yep. Or if the schools cancel, things like that. But otherwise, Wednesday nights are happening. Uh, Wednesday nights start off first at five thirty uh, with me, Mike Drop. We're going through the Book of Acts. We're going slowly. Uh, we just finished Acts chapter four. Actually got most of the way through Acts chapter 4, so this week we're going to just finish off because I think it tags into chapter 5 too well. So we're going to spend time on uh, the way that the church shared with each other this week. Um, moving on, family night is normally what we're talking about when we talk about Wednesday night, and that is to say here in church we have Kids Church downstairs, uh, and that is led by Diana and Nick, at least for the next two weeks. And then... Um, then also, at the same time, there's a life group that meets, and uh, they're going through Genesis still, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Moving on with the life group transition, we have two other life groups. Um, one that meets on Tuesday night online. Uh, contact me for the program. We use Discord for that. Um, and then also the Thursday morning ladies life group that meets here at 9.30. And uh, uh, we want to let, let you be aware of, if you've had a bulletin, you've seen it, uh, but we have subscribed to Right Now Media, and we've been subscribed for a rather long time. Uh, it's pretty much a Christian net Netflix. It has a ton of Bible studies, a ton of small group stuff. Um, it's a great re resource to, to use in a group or to use at home, just to grow in your faith, and it is completely free for you. So uh, head over to crchristian.org forward slash right now media and sign up for it. Uh, uh, it's, it, it is an amazing tool that, that you will really, really want to use. Uh, one
One last thing. Nick's going away. What? I, why'd you distract me and waste time? Nick's uh, going away breakfast is the last Sunday of February. He's going to leave right after, so come in early and enjoy some food and say goodbye to Nick. I'm going to do the joke again. Bye, Nick. Bye. Let's worship. here braving the cold and that you joined us all uh, we are going to spend some time in worship and praise but first let's stand and just lift up a prayer father we come before your throne to bring you glory to bring you honor to glean from your word the word that you have given us so that we can come to know you better that we can come to serve you fuller uh, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we can learn freely and, 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 and show our love and faith for you. Um, it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. the 
take a moment just to greet the people around you make sure that you've said hi to everyone let them know that you love them if you are on the live stream we welcome you we thank you for joining us if you have a device that lets you go ahead and leave a comment let us know that you're watching
It's just hard to believe the grace you pour out on me. I guess I'm just starting to see. to
church there's a saying which goes like this better to stay silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt uh, I believe which means we should be careful of what we have to say uh, I'm going to read James chapter 3 7 through 10 All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise the Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. We have been made in God's like who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth we praise and cursing. Come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Uh, sometimes words can cut deeper than a knife. Jesus said in Luke 40, uh, chapter 6, verse 45, A good man brings good things out of all the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of all the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. With today's political climate and general public dissatisfaction of any number of things, it seems many people are getting swept up in the worldly happenings, taking our eyes off the Lord, causing us to stumble, maybe saying or doing something we shouldn't. It could be big or small, like knee-jerk posting or commenting reactions online, something that is outrageous or downright ignorant. Or like me, getting bent out of shape by other drivers I have the displeasure of sharing the road with, uh, resulting in me saying things I probably shouldn't. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, he says, uh, let's see. My, brother, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger reminds me of some of the fruits of the Spirit, and also uh, marks of wisdom. And James talks about that also in uh, chapter 3, 13 through 18. Uh, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or, or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and, ev and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Reflecting on communion and what that means uh, with our relationship with Jesus Christ and his with us, I just encourage us all to remember to be peacemakers throughout the week. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, who we are all made in the image of. We praise your name and, and curse creations with the same tongue. Lord, please forgive us and give us your wisdom so we have spread the light and hope in the dark world. Thank you for your grace and mercy and uh, your work on the cross, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Hello, am I on? You can hear me? I get that weird, awkward transition from that to here. <laughs> It'll be awkward later, too. Um, I promise you that. But um, welcome, everyone, here. We, as I said earlier, I'm just going to repeat everything I said before. Glad to see you. Glad you made it out in the cold. Everyone on live stream, we are glad to have you join us. Um, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm not sure if most of you guys know this. It's, it's kind of a secret. Um, life is stressful. I know. Most of you probably didn't know that, um, but now you do. Life is stressful, um, and honestly, I doubt I'm telling you anything that you don't already know. Often we try to eliminate those stresses. Uh, some people try and eliminate those stresses by distracting themselves from them. Some people try and eliminate those stresses by... Uh, taking control by organizing to attempt to achieve some semblance of sanity. I'm one of those. Uh, most of you know, uh, before I came here, before I moved out here, I worked at Target. Um, I was not in charge, okay? It's important for you to know. I was not in charge, and it drove me insane. I worked in the grocery section, and soon after I was hired, soon after I was trained and put into the grocery section, our, our ETL, our, our executive team leader, the manager um, who was over us, he left. Uh, he, had, he had family issues. His, his wife was sick, and so he had to leave. He transferred to a different store um, that would be less stressful. Um, so he left. And then soon after that, our team leader, who... Uh, was over Starbucks and food, 
she also left. She got a job uh, chasing after what she wanted to do. Um, and so we were all really happy for her. We were told that the market team, we'll get a new team leader for you. We promise. It's going to be soon. But soon as things happen, become less soon. So we were just a small area of the store, one of the smallest areas of the store, which, mind you, I want to point out, also brought was like the highest, the second highest grossing area of the store. But even that, we still couldn't get treated, you know, with, with kind of the, the help that we thought we deserved. We joked that we were the little orphan Annie redheaded um, child that no one, stepchild thing that no one wanted. Um, so we were just kind of ignored. So I took it upon myself to organize this team, not because I cared about Target's bottom line. I didn't. Not because I cared about making uh, my higher-ups look good. No, I did it for my safety. I did it because um, every mistake that was made uh, or everything that was put off because someone didn't want to do it, I had to take care of because I couldn't just let it sit there and I couldn't be like, you know, ignore it. I had to fix it. And so I was like, here, let's, so, let's suss out the root of the problem. Okay, they need to do this, and they need to make sure they're backstocking things correctly. They need to make sure they're not doing this. It's messing up the system. And I take time, and I, I harped on them. I probably wasn't nice. I didn't use bad words. I just, uh, you know, I expressed my irritation. And eventually, we got them to start doing things as, as it was. And they realized, oh, if I do this correctly now, I don't have a harder time later. Well, we finally did get in our new team leader, uh, just in time for her to take credit for all my hard work. Um, still bitter. No, she didn't do that. She, uh, she, she was actually very appreciative and understood um, like you know, what had gone down. Well, because someone else had started uh, getting sick and stuff in his area, I ended up taking over the freezer. So every time Carl's like, oh, how are you liking the cold? I'm like, I worked in a freezer for like half a year. <laughs> I'm fine with the cold. It got to the point I went in there, all I had to do was gloves, because if, um, if you know me, my hands get cold real quick. They're, they're, they're slender. I don't keep warm. Um, anyway, so I worked in the freezer, and I fixed that, too. I got everything super organized, but the problem was I, worked, I only worked five days a week, um, which means five of those days, there's half a day there that I'm not there uh, making sure that things are getting done. There's two days I'm not there at all, and I'm not making sure things are getting done. And no matter how much work I put into it, I never felt happy. I never felt satisfied. I never, like, felt relieved of the stress. Um, and I would express those frustrations. Fortunately for me, the freezer is a big steel box, and no one could hear me outside of it as I'm yelling and, and yes. <laughs> I would just be like, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I look around the room, and I got to think, uh, without pointing fingers here, I'm actually going to look up at the ceiling so that no one gets offended thinking I'm accusing them of something. <laughs> I know there are other people in this room who also feel like they must have control in order to de-stress. And so I got to ask, has it ever taken an ounce of stress away from you? I know there are fellow micromanagers in there who need to constantly be in control. It's the only way we know what's going to get done, right? Has it ever brought you peace? Because one day you know, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. Someone else is going to have to do it. And, and you're going to strive and fight to maintain that control because we think it brings us comfort. But our efforts will never be lasting. I'm going to stop my introduction there because whew, uh, it's going to get a little depressing if I keep going. So uh, join me in prayer real quick. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you because life is sometimes just a repetitive cycle of us desperately grasping in futility for the slightest bit of comfort that control and order uh, can bring us. We turn these things over to you. Uh, be with us today as we search your word to find the true and everlasting source of comfort that's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. This morning, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. It's a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'll give you a moment to get there. I thought I could ramble a bit while I waited for people to find it in their Bibles, but I thought it'd be more fun if I just stared at you awkwardly, judging at how long it's taking you to find it. Dang it, you and your phone. <laughs> All right, uh, are you there? Allons-y, we will go. 
I'm not there, but I got it bookmarked. All right. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. As to what will you eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, they do not spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. While I was reading that passage, every time, and I mean every time I read through that passage, trying to prepare my sermon, um, all I could think of was that song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I don't even know that song, honestly. I know that line. Um, I know that it's pronounced provider. Uh, but if you asked me to sing it, I couldn't sing it. I, could, I don't even think I'd get the right syncopation on the notes uh, in it. But Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And it's very obnoxious, by the way, to get a song stuck in your head that you don't know. Um, but it's all that I could think of. Because it's the first point Jesus makes in this movement of the Sermon on the Mount. God provides. Okay, All of verses 25 through 30, all of it is to drive home two ideas. And the first one is God provides. He gives two examples of things that are beautiful in nature. It's Valentine's Day, so uh, it's right for me to talk about flowers. Um... How many of you guys have gardens? You like flowers. You like watching them grow. How many of you like getting flowers for Valentine's Day or just randomly? My mom loves flowers. She loves them. Uh, She has so many vases. They're all stored underneath uh, the sink, and and she pulls them out, the right one for the right color and the right bouquet. She loves flowers. I don't get flowers. And by that, I mean, like, I don't understand them. Flowers, to me, is just... It's allergies, and it's a pungent smell that I have never grown to appreciate. I'm sorry, I don't like it. (laughs) And that's just me. I'll admit, I'm a monster, though. Birds, birds I do like. Oh, I love watching birds. I know there are some bird watchers. Scott and Amy have have a birdhouse and a book on their porch where they, uh, do both of you watch birds, or is it just one of you? Yeah, birds. I love birds. I love watching birds. The birds that I like watching, though, aren't probably the birds they'd want by their bird feeder. I love the birds of prey. I love watching them fly. I love watching them as they just rise up suddenly on a a pocket of warm air. I love birds of prey. I love it when they dive, the power, the majesty. Those are pretty. I'm going to warn you, if you're ever driving in a car with me and there is a bird of prey flying, you're in charge of watching the road because I'm not going to be. I'm going to be (laughs) distracted by this majestic creature that God made. Okay, I do love birds. But Jesus goes and he starts his sermon by pointing out these two things that people like to find beauty in. And we can, agree. we can agree. There are a lot of bird watchers. There are a lot of people who like getting flowers. Flowers and birds. And he says, um, in all their beauty, he tells us first how God cares for them. Birds don't plant. Birds don't harvest. They don't store in barns. Have you ever seen a barn, a bird barn? It's cute. It's adorable, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, no, because they don't have them. And yet, the Lord provides for them. The lilies of the field, they don't toil, they don't spin, yet not even Solomon in all his splendor is clothed like one of these. God knows that birds need food. Most of you know birds need food. Jesus knows, as he's saying this, hey, flowers need 
petals. Probably more than anybody else at that point in time in history, Jesus knows flowers need their petals. They need their petals to attract pollinators to come, and as they go and, and get that, that sip of sweet, sweet nectar, they bump up against the stamen, they take the pollen to another flower, and they, they, they drop it off there, and that's how seeds, uh, or that's how flowers seed. God knows birds need food. He knows that, that flowers need petals. But Jesus is trying to explain something here. Their existence is not wasted planning for those things, which is uh, where we land on our second point. Verse 25 says, Don't worry about your life as to what you will eat or drink, nor for your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and is the body not more than clothing? I'm going to read that again. Don't worry about your life as to what you will eat or drink, nor for your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and is the body not more than clothing? This is what he's driving at in this first movement. You are more than your needs. Okay, God understands that you have needs, but you are more to him than your needs. The father feeds the birds. Are you not worth more than birds? The father clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace. Are you not worth more than they? You are more than your needs. God loves the flowers of the field. He created them. God loves the birds of the air. He created them too. And God loves you. But unlike the birds and the flowers, God created you in his image. God provides, and you are more than your needs. Jesus ends each one of these examples um, kind of with a rebuke. Verse 27, after talking about the birds, he says, And who, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And then again, we see another rebuke in, in verse 30. You of little faith. He uses this harsher rebuke to transition us into verses 31 and 32, which is where we're going to transition into the second part of his sermonette. You of little faith, stop worrying about these things. Again, Jesus is not saying stop taking care of yourself. You remember, he knows you have needs. He isn't saying stop going to work, stop paying your bills. Even the birds still have to hunt for food. The flowers still have to convert light into energy and grow petals. So what is he saying? One of my favorite attributes of God comes from the Ten Commandments. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. You shall not worship them or serve them. Here it is. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I love that about God. I love that he is jealous. I know that sometimes that can cause confusion among us as we're trying to understand this infinite being. Uh, Michael, God tells us not to be jealous, right? I know that this attribute um, actually was a huge part in Oprah's deconstruction or whatever of leaving her own faith. Um, she couldn't grasp this idea that God is jealous. If God is love and love is not supposed to be jealous as we see in 1 Corinthians, then how can God be a jealous God? And while it drove her away, it, it has the opposite effect on me. Um, God is jealous because God knows uh, no other thing, no other idol, no other spirit, no other angel, no man or woman is as great as he. He alone is worthy of your worship, our worship, my worship. He alone deserves your praise. And when we allow things to occupy that throne in our thoughts, he gets jealous. Even when those things are things that we need, remember, and I'm going to say it a couple more times, he knows that we need those things. The second half of verse 32, for your father, your heavenly father knows that you need all those things, all right? He gets it. But when it takes over, we have created for ourselves an idol, a thing that we worship in place of God. Having everything all planned out is not going to make you immortal. Verse 31 informs us the Gentiles they concern themselves constantly with these things, with what they will eat, 
with what they will drink, with what they will wear. And we are not Gentiles. Back then, yes, most of us would have been Gentiles. Um, but, but we have a better promise. That is not true today. Much like the, the Jewish audience that Jesus is talking to in this moment, now in our lives, we are children of God. Ephesians 2, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. We are not Gentiles. So if we are not Gentiles, stop behaving like Gentiles. In verse 32, Jesus says that the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. The birds, yeah, they take care of their needs. The flowers, yeah, they take care of their needs. We should seek to fill our needs. But the Gentiles, those who do not know God and are not his children, have not been grafted in. They eagerly chase all of it. They allow it to consume their thoughts and their time. And if this consumes all of your thoughts and your time, what do you not have time for? Your creator. Your creator who has adopted you into his household. Don't set your mind on the things that will pass away when you can set your mind on the one who won't. That's what will bring us into our last portion of this movement. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus isn't saying, don't worry about your needs. He instead is saying, shift your priorities. Don't be like the ones in verse 30 who have little faith. Don't be like the Gentiles in verse 32. Instead, do this. Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first. What Jesus is doing uh, is constant throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? It is his main goal when he starts in the Beatitudes way back in chapter 5, it is his main goal when he talks about committing murder and, ad murder and adultery in our hearts. It is his goal on the topic that immediately precedes this passage when he talks about serving money or serving God. In all of it, he's trying to get his audience to shift their focus to the things that matter. The things of heaven the spiritual things. You want to learn how to de-stress? It's right here. Change your perspective. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's easy. I know it's not easy. I'm ADD. I'm very distractible from any task I'm doing. As I was writing this sermon on Tuesday, I had to go and shut Nick's door because his music was just a little bit too loud. And I can't hear music and be writing I can't. Uh, I can do the mic drop with, like, instrumental, but, like, as I was writing the sermon, I couldn't put on music in the background. I can't. I get distracted. If you cross into my peripherals, I'm going to have to look. I'm going to have to have to try and see what's going on. And this is true for all of us when it comes to God. It's sad, but it is true. Sometimes God can seem so far away because our minds get clouded with the hundred things that are happening this morning and with the thousand things that we have to do this evening and with the million things that could screw up any one of our plans. It's so very easy for this moving item in our peripherals to distract us from the constant God that we should keep our focus on. Verse 34. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. How do we get there? How do we get to that place? Seek uh, his kingdom first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Set your mind on him, to him, in everything. Your car starts this morning. Praise God. Your car doesn't start this morning. Pray to God. You are going to be inundated with distractions from the moment you wake up to the moment you go back to sleep. And sometimes, sometimes we're not even safe inside of our dreams. Refocus. Psalm 121, 1 through 2. 
I will lift my eyes to the mountains. Where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the God who is worthy of your praise, worthy of your efforts. He is jealous of your affections, but he is the maker of heaven and earth. He can provide for your needs. Set your mind on him. The Bible titles this section of scripture in my Bible, The Cure for Anxiety. You want to find the cure for anxiety? It's not just right here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. It's in the whole Sermon on the Mount. It's what Jesus is trying to tell us for three chapters in Matthew. It's what he tries to establish in the very beginning of his earthly ministry. Don't allow the earthly and temporal distract you from the spiritual and the eternal. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we are far too easily distracted. Our minds wander. Help us to keep them set on you. Help us to refocus, to, to set our mind on, on the thing that brings true peace. You, your son, the fact that there is more to this life than what we have. Keep our minds set on you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. We are going to do um, a new song. Some of you might know it. Um, I believe it, it just captured, in fact, it inspired most of this sermon. So uh, I, I invite you to stand and, and worship and praise with us. If you uh, figure it out and sing along with us, that's great. If you just want to contemplate and study on the words, that's also great.
sell yourself to buy the one you found. The two things you told me that you are strong and you love me. Yes, you love me. thank you all for coming. Um, God's love is strong, and it is a point that we can set our focus on the future. We can set our focus knowing that in the end, in the end, whatever happens today, whatever happens tomorrow, we look forward to his kingdom, and we can find strength. We can find peace. I'm, again, just I'm glad you joined. Um, we have, I don't think we have anything coming up. A um, couple announcements I would like to make. Wednesday nights we still have everything coming up. We're getting ready to launch. We are looking for volunteers uh, for either Wednesday night. We are also, I believe, looking for volunteers for possibly Sunday morning in children's. Um, so if that's something that... Uh, you want to do, if that's something you don't want to do, but you feel like, you know, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you should do this, um, speak with Diane. Uh, we, are, we are in that recovery phase, and it's good to see us uh, planning and getting ready for, for Children's Church on Sunday morning again. Um, it excites me. With that, uh, we're going to close. Um, I will pray again, then we're going to do a, a closing song and dismiss you all. Jesus, your sacrifice paved the way for us to no longer be Gentiles, no longer be separated from your Father. It is, it is your death and resurrection that paved the way, that showed us how to find peace. We thank you, and uh, we want to take that good news, that good comfort out into the world, out into our neighborhoods, out into our workplaces. The kingdom of heaven is advancing. Let it advance uh, through us, with us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Is gone. You are the one who calls me on. You are the light. You are the fight that's in my soul. I know your resurrection now burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. Dismiss. We love to see you. We love seeing you here on Sunday morning. Hope to see you back next week. Be safe out there. Get warm. Conqueror.